next role. With me from uh, Heart of the Customer, I also have fellow analyst Cameron Metcalf and our wonderful graphic designer, Chris. I'm not going to spend too much time on introduction since uh, that's one of the first things that we're going to do as a group. For our agenda today, first, we're going to start out with a little bit of introduction, a little bit of an icebreaker, uh, about 20 minutes of a research review. Again, content that is slightly different than what was presented yesterday. Um, but if you did, uh, miss any of yesterday or uh, October 3rd's webinar content, the full report is linked or I should have sent it to you via email. Then we're going to open up the conversation. I have some prompts for you for the remainder of our time. To begin, I'm going to have everyone go around and quickly introduce yourselves. Of course, I'll start. Uh, so my name is Diane Schnitker. I'm a senior analyst for Heart of the Customer. I've been working in CX for four wonderful years, primarily focused on journey mapping, a little bit of a dashboard metric and survey work. I'm located in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I do have a pet. She is beautiful, uh, just so you're all aware. It is about mail time where I am, so if you hear her barking, don't be annoyed because it's just my beautiful uh, black lab. Uh, you can just remember how cute she is in case that does happen. Uh, Chris, would you like to go next? Oh, you're muted. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris LaFaver. I've been working with Heart of the Customer for really since the inception of Heart of the Customer, which is nine years now. I'm also located in Minneapolis, and I have a pet, and she's about the same size as Maya, and she's a mix, and her name is Chloe, and she keeps me very busy. Cameron, do you want to go next? Yeah, my name is Cameron Metcalf. I'm a CX analyst here at Heart of the Customer. Uh, I've been with Heart of the Customer for about six months, but I would say total time in CX has been just under a year. I'm located in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I actually have two dogs and a cat. Our cat's name is Lemonade. Uh, we've got a Corgi mix named Bo, and then we've got an Australian Shepherd mix named Gizmo. Please tell me Lemonade is named after a Beyonce album. No, a little girl decided to name her, and my wife was so enamored by it that she's like, we're keeping the name. We're going with it. So Love it. That's what it is. Uh, and then I don't want to pick on you, but Ishara, I did meet you yesterday. We sat at the same table for a little bit. Do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, so my name is Ashara Rice and I am one of the brand and marketing managers at Intellios, which is a healthcare um, certification organization. Uh, I don't have formal experience with CX, but I feel like, you know, a lot of what we do in brand and marketing um, could be considered kind of that CX work. And so I'm kind of not even in my first year. Um, so it will be an interesting, um, I guess, observation of, of this focus group, um, which could also be considered, you know, CX or just research in general. Um, and I am located in Columbia, Maryland. And I don't have a pet, but my friend, one of my best friends just adopted a cat. So I think that I can say that she may be like my god pet. <laughs> um, so her name is Smoke. She's very cute. Um, they're they're obsessed with her. And I had a lot of um cats growing up. So definitely, I don't... <laughs> definitely counts. Yep. Uh Beth, do you want to go next? Uh sure. Uh, my name is Beth Hollenbeck. Um, I'm a VP of CX at Duck Creek Technologies, and we're actually a heart of the customer customer. Um, I've been doing CX for just over three years, and I finally, actually yesterday, I finally got around to doing my application for the CCXP um, certification. Um, so it's just been over three years. Um, and I do not currently have a pet, although my kids have been campaigning for a dog for about two years, and I haven't yet given in. Hmm. Just wait till they're old enough to pick up poop and then, then you can give Oh, it. they're old enough. No, oh. no. I've got a sophomore in high school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't trust they, them. Is the are they trustworthy enough is the question. Oh. Lisa, what about you? Lou, I am the manager of customer advocacy um, for Beckman Coulter. We're in the um, healthcare space 
um, clinical laboratories. So COVID testing and all of that was a big thing for our, the whole world now knows a little bit more about lab folks. Um, um, I am in my manager role just um, at a year and I've been specifically in um, customer advocacy for four years. Um, I live in Williamsburg, Virginia, and at the moment we are petless because I'm on the road a, a lot. <laughs> so my uh, my grandson is 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 uh, campaigning hard as well. So we'll see. <laughs> Thank you very much. What about you, Carol? Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Gaddis. I'm an airport manager here at Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport in my eighth, approaching my eighth year of customer experience and uh, no pets on this end. Not a pet lover. Sorry, guys. No, no problem. Hi, Carol. Patty. We're, gonna, we're gonna get you back as a keynote for next year. <laughs> Sorry about that. Carol, you can claim that big flamingo in the in the uh, airport i could do that i could do that patty are you with us yeah i'm here um i i'm sorry i didn't hear that earlier um but i am i've worked in cx for quite some time i have been a vp i have been a principal analyst and i've been a principal consultant inside of it so i'm a bit of experience in it. I have two dogs with me. One is not really my dog, but he's adopted me because I'm the work from home person. And the other one is brand new to us. She's almost a year old. And uh, both of them are stacked because I walked them right before this so that they would be real. Excellent. And Gabby. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Gabby Roberts. I've, I am the VP of Client Experience at a company called Portfolio. Um, and we, I'm located out of Strongsville, Ohio. I've had over 20 years in the industry, you know, in the industry of client experience, but we don't have a formal even journey map or anything like that. So I want to get a lot of structure around it. And um, I, I uh, have two dogs. Um, they're adorable. One is named Ella and one is Oliver. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, Roxy. Hello, hello. Um, I have been in CX just over three years. Um, I am outside of Denver, Colorado. And um, let's see, I'm working kind of as a consultant. My full-time gig is I work in customer insights with the Nielsen. And then I do, and I have done, and I currently do um, work for contact centers, uh, work a lot with the Genesis and dashboards, metrics, KPIs, oh my. Uh, so that involves a lot of customer sentiment and survey work. Um, we have our Andy girl, who is a very high maintenance diva of a golden doodle. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, almost through here, we have Heather next. Hi, I'm Heather Healy. Um, my current role is as a business relationship manager and organizational change management lead um, on an effort with a, um, a DOD contract for the Air Force. Um, CX wise, even though we did not call it CX back in the 90s, I have over 27 years experience that touches on many um, elements from product design, brand development, and marketing, then moving over to consumer goods for big pharma before coming into the government and ensuring that um, we measure program success and look for cost savings and user experience. I oversee a lot of cross-functional teams right now to ensure that we deliver what our customer needs, we deliver that value, and then I reinterpret all of our data and teach others on how to interpret that data to tell the good story and or look for areas where we um, need to make improvement and then take those tools and lift and shift them to other programs to help raise them up and raise the bar. 
I do have, uh, oh, I'm in Massachusetts. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, and I do have a dog. I have a 10 year old strawberry blonde Sh- shepherd Malinois mix. And she is by my side 24 seven. So uh, we adopted each other. Excellent. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Christina. Hi there. I'm sorry I'm not on video, but I am on my mobile. And that's not a very flattering picture to be looking at your phone while also being on video. So um, I have been in, um, I'm in North Carolina. Um, I am the principal for a consulting company called uh, CX Solutions. Um, But prior to that, I was a senior vice president of customer experience and innovation, which included our IT function. So there was a merge between those. Um, I've been in telecom for 30 something years, AT&T, uh, Blue Stream Fiber, uh, some other Verizon, some other telecoms. And I have two pets um, and some grand pets. Mm-hmm. The two pets are a giant schnauzer, she's 13, and a five-year-old boxer who is high maintenance. If anybody has a boxer, they know what kind of, what, but she's very lovable. My uh, neighbor actually has a boxer who's also named Maya. I swear I named my dog first, so it can get confusing when we're outside, but very cute. Uh, Anya. Hi there. I'm Anya Paulson, uh, Director of um, Customer 360 at Unifirst. We manufacture and launder uniforms all over the country and Canada. And um, I have been in some form of customer experience for um, my whole career, um, which I won't, I, that's going to say how old I am if I say, <laughs> but um, a long time. Um, and I am located in Wilmington, Massachusetts, or my headquarters is in Wilmington, Massachusetts, but I live in lovely Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And um, I do not have a pet, but my two kids probably really want uh, one. My daughter wants a cat and my my son wants a dog. So I'm sure we'll get one at some point, but we're not ready yet. (laughs) Thank you, Anya. Josh. Oh, hello everyone. Uh, Yes, Josh Nard here. Uh, So years in CX, uh, it's been probably, I would like to say about 10 years of consulting clients in in the CX space. I'm based in Chicago and I do not have a pet right now. we lost our dog of, of 18 years a few years back, but uh, yeah. Uh, other than that, excited to be a part of this team, and uh, you know, enjoyed enjoying being able to join you today. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. And I'm sorry for your loss, but congratulations on the absolute triumph of 18 years. That's a, a good long life. Yep. And last but not least, Meredith. Hello, I am Meredith Brandenberger. Um, currently, my title is design and social media coordinator. So I'm a graphic designer. Um, I have been doing social media, but over the past several years, I've been getting into user experience design and working with developers on updating websites and portals and apps and stuff like that. Um, so all of our technology base Um but have come to realize it's not just about the technology, there's a lot more involved. Um, So I'm actually transitioning to a customer experience manager um, over the next several months. Um, So my years in CX are technically nothing, but (laughs) (laughs) we're working on it. Um, I'm located in Lansing, Michigan, and I have two cats. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone, for those quick introductions. As you can see, we have a lot of varied years of experience as well as different responsibilities within this room. So I'm going to beg you for the rest of the presentation, please feel free, interrupt me with any questions as we go through our research review, but also speak up if there's any advice that you want to give others or any like burning questions on your mind where you're like, this is a huge hole in existing research, existing resources. This is something that the CXPA should be focused on moving forward. So keep it pretty interactive. Again, you're only going to hear me talking for about the next 20 minutes uh, before we have a group conversation, but feel free to interrupt me at any point. 
very quickly. Again, the research was conducted earlier this year. We spoke to 28 individuals uh, in total, varying job titles, as you can imagine, uh, customer insights manager, global customer quality manager, director of CX insights strategy, you can call yourself whatever you want, but everyone that we spoke to was in essence a CX leader and had very similar goals as they were trying to build or revitalize a CX program. Uh, we didn't necessarily speak to people who were had the uh, lucky opportunity of stepping into a CX uh, role that was already set up and running perfectly, right? It was either something they were starting from scratch, brand new, or something that was stagnant for a couple of years that they were chosen to try to amp up and revitalize varying uh, industries as well. And the method of how we collected our data was one-on-one, 45-minute -on -one, in-depth interviews. So if you were at uh, yesterday's CX Forum, we dove straight into the journey map. But the content that we didn't necessarily focus on quite as much were some of the key takeaways, the key themes from our research, which is what I'm going to take you through today. Uh, and then for our conversation, we're going to use the journey map as a guide and kind of go through phase by phase. When we were charged with this research, really, we were trying to answer three key questions. One, who are today's CX leaders? Two, what are they struggling with? And three, what is key to their success? Uh, I forgot to mention it, but with our method of recruitment, which was basically going out to CXPA members and saying, raise your hand if you would like to participate uh, and you're within your first year. Those were the only two parameters that we had. We luckily had a little bit of self-selection bias, which meant people usually had some type of success that they wanted to share. So the research that we did by no means was represented, re representative of everyone's experience as a CX leader. But it was for the people who were in the middle of or near ending their first year and had something exciting that they wanted to share back with the CXK, CXPA community. So who are today's CX leaders? I heard a lot of this yesterday, meeting with people, networking, as well as a conference that I was at last week. It's clear that people who work in CX are extremely passionate. I don't care if you are working with customers, clients, patients, every CX professional that I've ever spoken to has a deep empathy that comes very naturally. They truly care about the experience that their company is providing to their customers. And that's something that I absolutely love about working in this profession and getting to interact with all of you. Uh, Double-edged sword though, right? Passion can make you uh, put a lot of pressure on yourself, which can lead to pressure, uh, stress, and burnout. Next, the leaders that we spoke to, the 28 individuals that this map is based on, were not willing to settle for the status quo. This is not something that is representative of the industry as a whole. We did some more uh, research on CX professionals in 2019. And we didn't have the same parameters of just someone in their first year. We had varying levels of experience, different roles that were represented, and we almost heard the exact opposite. There were a huge chunk of people that we spoke to that were tired of trying the same things over and over again to not really have a meaningful impact or create a meaningful change. So it was refreshing to me. And it also made sense that when someone's stepping into a new role, either they're fresh to CX and they got brought in from the outside or from the inside, or they might be coming from a role that they left for a reason. They didn't have the buy-in from leadership. They tried their best and they were looking for a new opportunity that actually had a belief in customer centricity and buy-in from the top down. Uh, so when you have that opportunity, either to build something from scratch or to really make a change, it was really exciting to hear people say how much of a change they wanted to make um, and that they were going to really shoot for the moon. Um, and this last one is definitely true of myself as a CX professional, but you have to forge your own path, right? Until recently, there was no such thing as a CX degree, and even now it's still pretty rare. So most people, uh, even though there are some more common backgrounds like psychology or market research, really have diverse past professional experiences. In this study in particular, um, we had scientists, we had engineers, 
Uh, my personal favorite was someone who came from the military. They were a explosives ordinance disposal leader, uh, I believe is the title. I only remember it because I loved his explanation so much. He said that basically CX was the same as his explosives ordinance job uh, because in the military, it was creating a safe space for this explosion, explosion to occur without harming anyone. Um, and that was his kind of analogy for what he does now as a CX professional. And also, uh, once you get a new role, you're probably not surprised to hear that whoever hired you might not necessarily have the best understanding of what CX actually is. Uh, so people who step into these roles don't have the benefit of a completely solid roadmap at most times. They don't have someone that they can ask, hey, how did you do that within their own company? They have to really kind of look outside of their own uh, personal network maybe through the CXPA, maybe through other people that they know to ask how to get things done because there's no one else at their company that they can go to and ask those specific questions of. What were the leaders that we spoke to struggling with? Small teams. It is very common in CX to have a head count of one. Uh, many people that I spoke to yesterday had just that. It also quantitatively is true. Um, I believe there's research um, that uh, my boss, Jim Titcher, conducted a couple of years ago that said over 75% of CX teams are working with a headcount of less than five, and many of those, uh, again, teams of one or two. If you're lucky enough to have a big team, which I know some are, uh, you might have a, a different challenge on your hand, but most of the people that we spoke to were, again, in those very small teams, which can also make CXing feel a little bit lonely. Uh, you have to be very good at making friends outside of your immediate team. Whack-a-mole problem solving, firefighting, only fixing problems after they come up and having to do them over and over again. I'm sure this isn't new to anyone who's sitting in this room. Um, if you disagree with any of these statements, you gotta speak up and tell me because you're probably doing something amazing if that's the case. Uh, this is exactly what our leaders were trying to avoid. Um, they've done this before. Uh, or they've been having to do it for part of their first year, and they know that it's no way to build an excellent CX program. Their vision for the future, what they're trying to do instead, is taking an intentional approach to designing their experiences. And then last but not least, CX teams are uniquely situated um, at most times, regardless of where you're reporting to, uh, could be marketing, could be directly to the CEO, which would be a, a very good case, could be to customer service, uh, could be to an operations leader. Uh, whoever you're reporting to, CX really does and should touch all different parts of the organization. So the leaders that we spoke to often refer to themselves as an internal consultant, right? I have the ability which I like to influence all different parts of the organization, not just one, but I don't necessarily have ownership or the authority to mandate some of the changes that I wanna have come across. How much uh, influence someone might have definitely can be dependent on how much their leadership is brought in. And on the other hand then, so there were the struggles, here are some of the keys to success that we heard. First, socialization and communication. Uh, I said it yesterday, I'm gonna say it again. It is not in the DNA of a CX person, leader, professional to say no to a meeting, uh, especially one with a stakeholder. Uh, the leaders know that you have to speak the language of your decision makers, of your leaders. You have to continuously, this isn't a, a one-time check it off the list and it's done task, continuously educate and sell what CX is and what it can do for the organization. On top of that, because we have a lot of influence and very small team sizes, uh, this was actually the title of one of the keynotes yesterday, uh, is making CX a team sport. To do that, you have to effectively use change management, whether that's having certified professionals on staff or embedding uh, key change management strategies into your practice, it is very important uh, because when all of the pressure, all of the weight of a good customer experience, which is really 
what a what a business is falls on one or two people. Uh, you're not going to get everything you want done uh, and you're going to be really stressed as you do it. And lastly, building the foundation of ROI. I know everyone's sick about hearing CX can't tie to ROI or it's so hard. That's not true. People have done it. We know it can be done. Uh, but in the first year, it, it might be too tall of an order uh, is what we heard. Out of the 28 individuals that we spoke to, uh, one person did successfully tie to ROI, which was really exciting. And she had a very positive end of her first year, but everyone else wasn't ignoring it. Yes, they didn't have time right away as they were standing up a program, but they had to make sure that while they were building it, they were getting baseline measurements, uh, that they were measuring the right things. So when they do start making improvement initiatives, that they could start to tie to ROI in the future. So it's, it's on the mind, uh, but it was unlikely to occur within that first year. And our two personas. Uh, so inside track Isaac and external hire Erica, uh, please ignore the genders. I'm sure you all can appreciate that it's easier to uh, have just a uh, one picture, but inside track Isaac could also be uh, an Ashara. It could be uh, an Isaiah. It could be an Ingrid and external hire Erica could be, could be an Eric, right? Uh, gender doesn't matter. What does matter is that for our inside track hire, they usually didn't have the most formal CX training or knowledge. They had passion, they had empathy for the customer. That's why they got offered this role. That's why they were told to do it. But what their superpower is coming in is that though they're gonna have a hard time catching up and realizing all of the different things that they could and should be doing, they have the benefit of already knowing who their leaders are, who's influential and what their company culture is. So what might work within here. Our external hire on the other hand, has probably been doing this for many, many years. She's led teams in the past. She probably already has her CCXP. Uh, so very good knowledge of what CX should be doing, but she has to play catch up either with the company or sometimes even the industry that she just got this new job. Show of hands here. Who at any time would consider themselves an inside track hire? Who came in from the inside? I see one, Meredith. Gabby. All right, so we got two hey, inside Dan, hires. I've done both. Perfect. So you, I'm assuming in your original one, you came up from the inside and then yeah. you moved on afterwards. And then I moved to another company and I've been there for less than a year. Yep. And Heather, you raised your hand there virtually. So we got a good mix of inside track professionals. We got at least one external hire now, Beth as well. Who else is more of a, an external hire? Anya. Does anyone not see themselves represented in either of these two paths? All right. I think we're good then. I actually, I mean, I'm not a, a CX leader, so I'm not one of these personas, um, but I was an external hire with zero experience, uh, which is uh, something that I think is more common for people who are stepping into a CX role that isn't a senior level or a manager level. Um, and that's because when you have to forge your own path, like many of our CX leaders do, wherever it is they came up from, they also have a unique realization that the pool of people that they can hire from to build out their team probably isn't going to have a lot of formal experience either. So you have to get creative in who builds your team just based on skill, sell, skill sets rather than past experience. And our journey map. So if you're at the forum yesterday or the webinar on October 3rd, you've already seen this. Uh, we've already introduced uh, the two personas. Uh, very, very quickly, I'll just highlight a couple of things. Of course, we have our legend, which features moments of truth, those moments that have a disproportionate impact on the journey. We have our friction points, those moments that uh, evoke a negative emotion. And then three icons to represent what our leaders identified as their key to success, which means utilizing data, 
having alignment with the overall vision and goals of the company or corporation, and also utilizing change management techniques. The four phases that we are very shortly going to walk through, discuss, um, and also talk about how it could be improved for someone taking a role in the future are, of course, getting the job in the first place, uh, getting familiar and acclimating in those first six months of a new role, socializing some of your quick wins and building out your team, and then strategizing, creating that vision uh, for the future, the long-term strategy. You can notice uh, that there's a lot of green in this first year. Again, I'll say we had some self-selection bias. People were excited to share their successes. Um, but even though we had some positive moments in the first year, of course, there's still going to be friction. And since we're lucky enough to have our graphic designer on the call, I did want to ask Chris um, what it was like creating this map, considering it's kind of a map of a lot of our clients as well. Um, sure. And I want to give a shout out to Anya. I met you at the conference last week and tried to get this to you and I kept getting it bounced back to me. So it, maybe you can just get this when you're, when we're done. Yes. One of your colleagues sent it to me. So thank you. All right. Great. So what it was like creating this map? Um, well, it was kind of a special project because it, it is about CX leaders and as you can see, which, which I thought was kind of interesting is that their paths basically converge towards the middle. They just separate a little bit according to, um, you know, things outside their control, such as you know, a budget, right? And, and actually once they kind of get over that first section of the year, their paths are pretty much in alignment. And I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. So that, and then maybe that has something to do with just that CX is one, it's a fairly, it's still a young profession. And two, that um, the job of CX, there's some commonalities no matter where you're working. And so that your path is going to be very much the same. Very true. Yeah, at the conference last week, um, I had the pleasure of speaking to someone that I'm working with currently, one of my clients, and I had absolutely no idea that she was in her first year as the CX leader for her organization. For some reason, it never crossed my mind to ask her how long she'd been there because she just comes across so professionally and she walks the walk and talks the talk. And when we got to meet and she was like, oh, tell me about some of this research. We're like, oh, she's an inside track. Uh, that's exactly who she is. And she could see kind of where she was um, within her first year when we, when we went through this. I do have a question of the group. So often when I create maps, I try to look for something that maybe, you know, is it's kind of like, what, what sets this apart? What's the thing in the map, right? And, and if you look at the top, the masthead area, the business units and C-suite. So what that, what that graphic represents is the, the CX is the gear, right? And it's like the change management that comes out of CX touches all these other business units. Is there anything that's missing there? Oh, I'm going to say one. Okay. So I had the pleasure of sitting next to someone yesterday who everyone kept poking on uh, her group at our talks. Finance, we were missing finance. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's yeah, we, we were all giving her a hard time at our table. <laughs> so. I'd like to add communications. Good ad, good ad, yep. Mm -hmm. Good question. That, Perhaps that yes, is really important. And so the other thing is earlier, I just, this is, I'm getting a little bit, there's a little sideways here, but Meredith, your uh, role as a graphic designer, I mean, I can relate to that because now I'm, you know, absorbing so much CX as well. Um, but last week at the conference, there was some talk about how CX is really integral to the brand and marketing, but I see it really as integral to brand 
because if you don't have a good CX program or you're not aware of it or it, it impacts your brand mm -hmm. to your customers. They, it's like it's like making sure that those, those brand promises can really be true. Right. CX should help you fulfill your brand promise. Or if you're not, then you know where you need to be working. Right. For sure. Yeah. And Josh, were you going to say something? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, to to that point that was made earlier about communications, I, I mean, so this is a great st start. I think you could possibly use this as sort of a, a layer to understand what is being conveyed, you know, from the business and the organization versus what is the, uh, the appointee being actually, you know, hearing and what are they sort of sensing within that cultural relationship as well? That could be sort of this inflection point where it's what they're hearing versus what the organization thinks that they're actually conveying. I think that's an interesting discussion to where you can see a lot of those deltas uh, and those differences or, you know, to a point that it might even show some of those pain points as you identified chaotic, stressed, overwhelmed, that might help add some additional information there. Good point. All right, now we're gonna to get to the fun stuff. Now we're gonna open the conversation. We're gonna go through phase by phase. Uh, here is just a slide with a, a recap of all of the moments of truth and friction points. I'm not gonna spend time going through them one by one since we're about to go through uh, phase by phase, which houses all of these moments of truth and friction points. So first, we let's put ourselves in the mind of a new CX leader. We are either being offered a new job if we're uh, inside track professional and saying, you know, hey, we really need to stand up this function. I'm going to tap you because you've done some great stuff in the past that I think fits. Or you're coming in from the outside, possibly coming from a bad experience, right? You left your previous job for a reason um, in many cases. And you're intentionally looking for not just a new job, but the next right role. Uh, so here are just some prompts, some questions I want to ask all of you. Please feel free to just unmute yourselves and answer them as you see fit. But what I'm looking to get out of is, one, a little bit of how you came into C CX. Does this fit for you? What attracted you to your current position, right? Which might give us some insight uh, on how companies might attract qualified CX professionals to a new role, right? What terminology, what benefits, um, and also what helped you find the right role? Were there any tools uh, that you utilized when you found your current job? I can get the ball rolling. Um, so I actually had a background in supply chain for about 10 years um, and COVID really made supply chain uh, really, really hard uh, to, to just want to stay in that industry. Um, and I had spent the last few of those years in supply chain, specifically in data analytics. Uh, and I wanted to still keep that muscle flexing, but just put it to work in a, you know, a different environment that wasn't supply chain anymore, because I was really feeling that burnout. Um, and kind of sort of stumbled into CX. Um, I had dabbled with, uh, I'm going to say some really primitive CX in my own like personal life with a nonprofit that I help run. Um, and that's what kind of attracted me to heart of the customer and wanting to take on that role a bit more professionally. And then all the pieces started to fall into place from there. How did you uh, find, find the job? Was it like LinkedIn? Was it a recruiter? It was LinkedIn. Oh, nice. It was LinkedIn. Yep. I can go next. Um, so as I've mentioned, I'm, I started as graphic designer going into like this UX designer sort of role. And as a UX designer, I was creating mock-ups and trying to do some usability testing with um, mm -hmm. some of our customers and doing some interviews and starting to get into like the researching kind of role. Um, I also noticed that we send out surveys and we get the feedback and then nobody really does anything with it. So 
I was like, hey, you know, send me that. I want to look through it and just started kind of going through some of the data. And I'm like, hey, this is really interesting. These people actually have like some great ideas about how we can improve. And I was surprised that nobody was monitoring it. And I was like, that's something that I'd like to do. And so we're trying to create that role. Um, and then we're also just starting to get into some journey mapping, um, seeing like what the actual experience has been um, in the company that I work for. Departments are very siloed and communications was sending out like marketing materials, but then our customer support team was sending out other letters and they look like they came from totally different companies. So trying to drive some of that branding and consistency and you know, really just having somebody to be able to oversee all of that. It's very interesting too. It's like a unified experience. Yeah. For for employees as well. Yeah. Anybody else? I, I can go. So one of my biggest things as an external person in my current job was um, sort of executive support and buy-in and really trying to assess how that was going to go in my new role. So for me, and I work in B2B. So for me, the biggest thing was who I was going to report to. And if I thought I had a lot of executive support um, and th that was kind of one of the main things driving my decision to jump into this new role. So who reporting to, that's kind of a guy easy question to ask or to assess in an interview process. What questions uh -huh. did you ask that helped you assess whether or not there was truly buy-in for your role? I asked a lot about other executives and if they really wanted customer experience to be stood up as a function, like it, whether they were hungry for it. So understanding mm -hmm. both from my potential boss, as well as, you know, his peers, um, trying to get a lay of the land of what kind of interest or support there might be for just having CX, regardless of who, of who starts the function. Mm -hmm. Were you prepared to walk away if you didn't get that feeling in the interview? Mm -hmm. And well, a funny story is um, I got a great feel with my, of like a uh, connection and buy-in from my boss. Uh, it was actually the COO, um, but he quit two weeks after I started. <laughs> Great resignation comes at all levels. Doesn't it? <laughs> uh, one more quick question for you. How did you happen upon this role? Were you recruited? Uh, did you seek it out on some type of board? Um, actually, it was a posting, but it was actually you guys were helping uh, my company uh, recruit and set up the function. So I actually interviewed with Jim Tincher um, as part of my interview process. Was he a good interviewer? He scared me because I, I watched his webinars right before my interview and he has all these webinars talking about how you're going to fail if you're from the outside. <laughs> I told him not to say that. I was like, Jim, that's not true. I probably it's not true. <laughs> Anybody else have a story they care to share? Then one final question is, do you feel that there are any resource gaps for people in this phase of uh, a new job, either coming from the inside or the outside? If so, help me dream a little bit. What can we create? What can we research to better uh, arm new CX professionals taking on uh, a leader role? Uh, I'll go on that one. Um, I think there's resource gaps as far as where to begin. You know, you could get a bunch of books and it just seems overwhelming. And really something like we're doing here where you could go 101. All right. You know, because I, again, I have, you know, well over 20 years in customer experience. And it's when I started digging in and learning about the framework, it's much different than I would expect. And, um, you know, data analytics and fi the financial side of things has never been, you know, something that really interested me in my roles. Um, and I oversee many departments. It's just, I, um, I rely on our finance department and the numbers don't, you know, other than making my budget. So I don't have to get too knee deep in that. So, you can get overwhelmed when you look at, you know, 
how to tie the numbers to ROI and all those things. So really giving examples on here's a strategy plan. Here's how you roll it out. Step one, step two, step three. Here's what you really need for your first journey map, you know, some good concrete examples. And, and maybe it's out there and I just don't know where to get it. I've actually hired myself a pretty expensive coach just for myself. Cause I'm like, I need somebody to just hold my hand through this. Do you think there's any competing stories that are being told out there currently about this? Or is it just a lack of one clear roadmap? You know, I don't know. I think a, a good book on first year in in creating a B2B, you know, and, and I'm sure people need it for B2C as well, but, you know, what, what do you do? Almost like CX for dummies type of book, not, not to be insulting, but like, what, what really does it look like? Does anyone on the call have experience kind of starting fresh as a leader two different times in different industries? And if so, did your same kind of plan work at both? I'll go. Um, so prior to being in an airport, I came from education. So obviously two very vastly different worlds. And in education, it more looks like customer service. So shifting into airports, it's an experience from curb to gate. But I found that there are those in the industry eight years ago who see customer service as not as an, it's, everyone is so hung up on customer service, like this transactional piece, but it's more than that. It's the experience, it's the data collection, it's all those things that Gabby was just talking about that if we were to provide a resource for dummies, for lack of a better term, um, it would be to help that individual be clear on what their role is, because more than often, you have to manage up. Sometimes you're hired to do something where they have a, a very basic understanding of what the role should look like, but you ultimately will drive what customer experience should be because there has been no data collection or there has been no journey mapping. So introducing those things, but you, you, the individual, you, the new hire, you've landed the job, what should it look like? And so some examples of that in this book, in this digital space, so that you, the individual can be clear in education. I was really clear, students first, everybody else was in line, right? So I was very clear there, but coming into this landscape, um, you have a lot of moving parts. So I grew into the role, um, but that was based on exposure too. So some of it, I just kind of flip-flopped into. And then I've, as this CX has really taken off, um, the learning came on the job, <laughs> not before the job. So um, so yeah, if, 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 if a person coming in for the first time could really fully embrace who they're supposed to be and what they should do to help drive the organization and ultimately improve those organizational results, whoever is in that C-suite will see your value right out the gate. Awesome. And what I think you just shared is the perfect segue, so I'm not going to waste the opportunity to move to my next slide, uh, which is the basically first six months on the job, right? You've found a new job or you've been asked to take it on and you've said, yes, this seems cool. This seems exciting. Um, what happens in this phase of the journey uh, from the leaders that we spoke to's perspective was getting up to speed in uh, our Erica external hires path means researching more about the company, the industry, making sure they're familiar with kind of the operations and what goes on uh, for our internal hire who usually has uh, quite a bit of understanding about what their company does, uh, which you'll be surprised at how many people get confused by what does your company do types of questions. Um, and also who their leadership is, has the daunting task of figuring out what CX is and what am I gonna do about it? Um, so that's our friction point for the internal hire. Meeting with stakeholders, extremely important. As Carol mentioned, managing up, identifying who holds the purse strings, who's influential in what different areas and how do they like to be presented with 
data with findings? How do they like to be talked to? Uh, reviewing data, friction point, regardless of who you are, I don't care. Uh, data can be big, it can be messy, and it can be hard to get your hands on, especially when you're new, uh, because people need to trust you before they kind of hand over the keys and say, yep, feel free, go dig around. Um, conducting a, a maturity assessment was also very common uh, within this first six months. It helped people figure out how mature my company is in CX terms. Uh, whatever maturity model you choose to use could be Forrester, uh, could be from another consultant, and also handling immediate business needs, right? Just because you're new doesn't mean there's stuff going on behind the scenes. Uh, that can completely stop in its tracks. A lot of leaders inherit things like loyalty programs, uh, surveys, or call center monitoring, uh, different types of tasks depending on the industry, and they need to make sure that that keeps going. So what can you all share about the very pivotal first six months getting familiar with a new company or with CX um, and how do you get up to speed? What are questions that you ask your stakeholders? How do you figure out how they tech? Do you have any advice for people in this stage? I can go. Um, this part is, uh, this stage is so critical because you're almost like trying to get ahead of people's perceptions of what you and your function are about, I think. So it's like, you know, people might have a sense of, oh, you're the survey person or um, you're the customer service person, like whatever preconceived ideas are. And so this is really your chance to kind of get ahead of that and kind of guide people's perceptions before they have a chance to either form or solidify their own. Good point. And I'm in agreement with that because again, those preconceived notions of what it should look like, either they're going to steer your work or you're going to steer your work. And so in as much as you're assessing and meeting and greeting and conducting assessments, um, using the right terms also can help change the culture. Using the right language um, so there it, it just doesn't bleed into other stuff. People get clear real quickly, but you've got to be you've got to lead the change. Anything on the data piece that anyone can share? Because I mean, I, I look at data all the time and mm -hmm. it's hard to find the clarity through the chaos. Um, and on top of that, sometimes, you know, when we work with clients, like, a giant fortune, whatever, 500 company. And we ask, do you have this measurement, this data? A lot of the times we just hear, I don't know, but probably. And it's like, yeah, you, it's definitely in there somewhere, right? What advice do you have for a CX leader who's struggling to find, organize, or get their hands on the correct information? I'll take that one. Um... This is a this is a topic that comes up from time to time, um, and in this space, working with clients, uh, there's times where we just need to move fast, and we need to lead with a hypothesis, and and then come back and talk about like how we validate that, right? But there's always that sense of trying to remind them as you're trying to get that data because it lives somewhere maybe not connected well, maybe it's not easy to attain. It's reminding them of how either impactful this decisions that they're about to make are going to either influence their next several quarters and those outcomes, or even to a degree of like how it actually uh, may, you know, drive additional, you know, financial factors or, or product development changes that could be you know, on various different levels, everything from support to change management to whatnot. And reminding them of that particular aspect, that's where you then want to say, how confident are we in making this decision without data? And then when you start to raise that discussion, then it's like, oh, maybe we should actually start to find this data. It's got to live somewhere. And then they start asking those questions. Um, so I think 
I like to frame that up when I'm talking with clients on that relationship to just say, I know this is challenging. I know this is going to, you know, involve you know, maybe 20 meetings on your end. I'm sorry for that. But, you know, getting them on board with them making that call, I think is where they then start to say, I've got to own this and I got to start making calls. That was really good. Really good. I have a follow up question to that. So, have you ever had the experience where your hypothesis um, didn't match the data once you got the data that you were surprised, or was it? Does it usually does it usually align? Oh, sure. I I mean, we've uh, we started with journey maps where we'll create um, a document, and not that there's a, a full. 360 degree, you know, pivot or 180 degree, you know, pivot on everything. But we may start to identify either there's a sequencing factor, maybe there's an urgency factor. Um, so we can lead with a lot of discussions, knowing with a sense of empathy what, you know, we're trying to solve for, especially on the business front. But then when you start to layer in that research, which we did most recently with a client, we started to see key, you know, moments in that journey that were definitely very profound, very, very important for us to solve for. And then we could even uh, really emphasize that a little bit more to your point. Thanks. And it's a twofold issue, right? So it's organizing, it's finding. And then the third piece of it that I think is really important is sometimes you know who has it, right? It could be a different team. It could be one individual, but they're hesitant to give you access or give you more than just one little piece of the pie at a time. Uh, does anyone have experience in overcoming that hesitancy and convincing someone that you are a partner rather than an adversary? I think, at least in my opinion, that can come down to being able to help provide a bit of a solution or at least something working towards a solution rather than just addressing a problem. I think if you only ever bring up a problem to somebody, then it feels almost antagonizing because it's something, you're putting something more on their plate that they've got to chew on and deal with, right? But if you can workshop in some small way, if not an entire solution, at least pathways towards that solution, it makes that person feel like you're on their side and you want their buy-in to be able to get to that end goal rather than just forcing them to, to deal with your problem. I think we actually had a quote from a leader who said something, uh, it, was a little, it was a little pithy, a little catchy, where their response was, you know, CX kind of acting as an internal co consultant. Uh, you can come across as the bad news brigade, like you only come in once a year, once every six months to tell everyone what they're doing wrong um, instead of sharing some of the wins as well, which everyone likes to be complimented. All right, and our next phase, uh, or first, any resource gaps, anything that you think should be worked on, uh, any resources that should be created for leaders? I think it'd be helpful to know what sort of data is good to look at because there's just so much of it and you know you can't look at everything especially in your first six months so if maybe there's like a couple key metrics you should start with I think that'd be helpful. I know we've been working on something internally uh, with our CTO and uh, data guy. I'm sure I could convince him to write a blog post about that. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Yeah, and I know just to add to that, it's unique for everybody's business, right? Like we all have different customers and different things, but when you step back and you think about it, what's like like some basic 101 things you could understand so that you could figure that out? Yeah. And it's simplifying it too, in a way, because yeah, there's... A lot of very complex uh, customer math that you can do. Everything's got a slightly different term. But if you like really take the 10,000 foot view, at, like a customer's full experience and the measures that exist throughout the journey, it's pretty much the same thing throughout all different industries, just with different names. 
All right, and now on to socializing. So in this point of our leaders first year, they were finally able, if they were smart enough to make sure they had the budget to add a headcount in their first year, uh, add on to their team. This could be someone uh, like an analyst or a different role to assist. Um, a lot of people have done this in the past and they know how hard it can be to be a one person show. So they wanted to avoid that. Uh, we got a little bit of a friction point here for our inside track hire who, didn't quite uh, know that you can't do this by yourself. So they're hoping to probably do that in years to come. Um, planning quick wins, of course, so they can share back some of what they've learned in about these first nine months with different business units, different teams, get some excitement uh, rolling around for the CX team, whether that be qualitative, quantitative data, uh, or both. What can you all share? Any tips or tricks on data socialization? Uh, where's the best place to hire if you're looking to build out your team and how do you make an argument to your leadership that you can and should be able to add headcount? I'll go first. Uh, so I was hired four years ago uh, by my boss, Jim Tincher, uh, and he found me very organically, right? It was just a lot of boots to the ground, networking, uh, met up for coffee. And after doing, um, since it, you know, like I said earlier, usually there's a very small pool of highly qualified. This is the exact experience I want to see on your resume candidates that you can pull from especially now, right? It's harder than ever to build out your team and hire. Um, so what Heart of the Customer does when we bring on new team members, Cameron can attest because he just went through this hiring process, is we don't look for any specific background, but we do have a somewhat simplified assignment, right? Do you have the, the basic skills, passion, and empathy for customers? And we do it just a couple exercises to test that out and blindly, uh, go through it as a team, grade the results. So that's one thing that we do. I have something to add to that because I was one of the people who interviewed you, Diane, and, and it came down to two candidates. One, Diane, the other person was very highly educated in, um, you know, I can't, I can't exactly name the degree, but it was kind of, you know, data um, mining some, some, it was very kind of scientific and uh, a lot of wow there. But I think that to Diane's point, it, it came down to who had the passion to grow with the company and to, and, and have a passion for really making customer experiences better. So it's, it's, it's more than that book smart piece. So you have to, and then because it is a newer field, I think it's, it's not as easily quantifiable in terms of degrees, who's gonna get the job. So, and Diane's gone on to absorb a great deal of knowledge. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, onto one of the next points, um, presenting that data. I will share what some of the people in this research had done that they found effective. Usually, again, in that previous phase, they figured out what makes my executives tick. Who's the guy who clings on to one customer story and he's going to ride that till the end? Who's the, who's the gal who's just focused on numbers, right? She just wants to know what the bottom line is, either financially or quantifiably. Um, so using a mixture was very important for those who were very successful in this. It wasn't one or the other, but it was both. Um, so qualitatively, I can attest that using videos in your presentation helps make things real, right? Oftentimes we can get hired because the CX team at an organization 
they're not unaware of what's going on with the customer, what the problems are, but their business won't listen to them. They won't believe them. One great way to get around that is by using customer videos, because then when you show your uh, report, you show this terrible score number comment and you pair it with someone who's actually saying what that experience feels like. It no longer makes it a question, but it makes it a fact. This is exactly what's happening. And are you going to look at that person in the face and say that it doesn't matter to fix this? Resource gaps. What content needs to be created to help this phase go easier for CX leaders? Not that I'm necessarily a CX leader, but I think something that would be really helpful to just see built out a lot more is how different people tether the quantifiable value of whatever their CX experience is tethered to dollar and how that improvement to each of those CX factors moves that dollar amount one way or the other, right? It's going to be different for every industry, but just seeing different approaches to how people build those matrices, I think is super neat and very relevant for just about everyone. Yeah, I would agree with that too, that having ideas from other people, like, um, options of how to set up a team, I think. And so for me, it's been a process of saying, okay, so for this sort of goal um, and where we want to get to, here's the team I need. And then the option over here, if we don't do that, we do this instead. Here's the kind of team I need. Um, and I've kind of been able to build that out by talking to people and see what they have done and kind of generating ideas that way. Different templates, I think. That's interesting. I also think just having information around, you know, how do you sell up to um, to the C-suite in getting them interested? So let's say you've landed the role and, um, and then you need to know, do you hire an organization like part of the customer? If you do, what are the selling points to that? Or do you hire like a consultant, a single consultant? And when do you bring them in? And when do you know what should be an expectation of you researching and presenting and owning on your own versus you leaning on someone else? So you don't like in my case, um, I'm a pretty seasoned executive here and I don't want to look incompetent. Like, quite frankly, you know, they rely on me to do a lot of stuff. I'm on a lot of strategy teams and like I'm. I have a title customer experience, VP of customer experience, and I run a customer um, service team and a contact center. However, our organization has never even been necessarily sold on, they think of it as customer service. And quite frankly, until I started digging into it myself, I didn't really know the difference and wouldn't be able to speak to it. So I've decided I want to bring my title to life. So I need to make my own job description. And I'm I'm just doing this on my own. Nobody's really told me I have to do it. I want to build a framework. I want to bring it to life. But part of me is like, I don't want them to incur a bunch of expense where I'm bringing them, hey, I suddenly need a budget of 100,000 to hire a firm to help us. What should I be expected to do versus when do I need to say I need help and why? So that's kind of um, a long-winded way to answer your question. Duly noted. And I also want to see if anyone on the call has an answer for you. Do you have any experience on separating what I'm going to do myself versus what I need help with? Well, I mean, I can speak to that just as a kind of an outsider, not a CX professional, but just what I've seen at part of the customer and our customers. I mean, they kind of run the gamut, but I think often we've had companies hire part of the customer um, when they are starting to build their CX team so that they can look <laughs> learn from part of the customer, not only for with us um, documenting journeys of their customers, but 
through workshops, through just being involved in the process, then they kind of take it over from there. Yeah, I oh, agree. Yeah. A lot of our a lot of our clients hire us because it's like a, a foundational piece of their research, right? Let's get right. a view of the current state. So that way we can make informed decisions about our data strategy, uh, about our measurement strategy moving forward. And, and there's another part of the comment about how do you bring the C-suite people on board? And I think you have to tie it to ROI. You have to somehow you have to tie it to um, there's a benefit and, and it's best if it can be financial, it's that's what speaks loudly, but I think there are other benefits too. And that, that's one, that was a big question last week at, at the conference. That was a big um, talking point, I guess. And people had different takes on that. Yeah, if you can tie it to uh, a financial for sure, or if something's like very clearly broken, right? If you can point to something and, you know, the saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If something's clearly broken and you need help fixing it, that's also a great time to go to your leadership and say, I can take you through all of the reasons why I know this is a big problem, but we don't know the exact why for our customer, how they're feeling, how they're experiencing it, um, then it's a great time to bring on a consultant to help do that research, especially if you're a team of one or two, right? If you have a really big team, uh, like Roxy Strominger at UKG has got a team of upwards of 12. Um, she got hired because they were sick of hiring consultants. So she has the appropriate size team who can actually go out boots on the ground and do all of the work themselves, which is amazing. Uh, but it's really hard if you're all by yourself and you're in a bunch of different strategy meetings, you're selling CX to your executives and you have to find time to do research on the side. All right, our final phase, which is strategize. Uh, this is creating long-term strategies. A lot of the leaders um, in our research used workshops, uh, of course, lots of meetings, sometimes hired outside uh, help like Qualtrics, Forrester, so on, to make sure that the long-term strategy, right? Not the break fix that I'm doing today, but what we hope to become in the future is fully aligned with what our organization wants to do moving forward overall. Uh, this is also the point where people started to evaluate the technology and data systems that they have behind the scenes. They didn't want to ask for a big budget up front to say, hey, all of these legacy systems that aren't talking to each other don't work let's spend $10 million and get a new platform, right? That's a little scary to ask in your first six months. Uh, so they waited until the end of the year to do that evaluation. And then also keeping that eye on ROI, most not succeeding in doing so their first year, but making sure they had a solid foundation that was scalable and could eventually tie to ROI in the future. So everyone in this room, how do you develop your long-term strategies? What tools? technologies do you love that you find to be very helpful and ROI, can you show it? If so, are you willing to share any of your secret sauce? Hey, Diane, for me, it's the, the part you said on aligning to corporate goals. It's that, and it's also aligning to what people already know to be important as in um, there's something to be said for, you know, highlighting the shiny thing that people are already focused on for my challenge has been, we have so many broken areas of the business and everybody knows those are broken areas of the business. And so it, you probably start with any of them and be fine and have an impact. So it's much more beneficial to be starting with kind of the things that people already in their gut support. So you're not kind of convincing people, but you're kind of going with what's a little, little bit less resistance around pursuing those areas as part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. Some tools that I personally love. Well, everyone loves Qualtrics, so I'm not going to give them uh, too much airtime because we were at a conference last week and everyone was like, yeah, I use Qualtrics too. It's great. Um, this is a much smaller company that I've always been a really big advocate for. 
and I'm not paid to say this. I don't receive any discounts on their product for doing so, but I believe in uh, talk triggers. You know, when someone gives you such a good experience that you want to tell others about it. Um, we use this really cool platform called Reduct for our video editing and uh, qualitative transcript coding. They're uh, pretty uh, inexpensive as far as human transcription goes. Um, so you're paying maybe just slightly more than if you're using a regular service. Um, but it's a great way to house all of your qualitative data in one source that you can easily parse into multiple folders. Also used as a great uh, coding platform. Um, and in the instance of someone saying, hey, what do we know about X, Y, or Z? I can literally put a minute, two minute video reel together in like 35 seconds. So really, really quick turnaround where I know video editing in the past has been like a huge headache, especially if you're not a techie. Someone had a question earlier as well about how to tie to ROI, specifically talking about those really long um, hostage customers, right? So when you have a customer who ne can't necessarily leave you because they're in a contract for three, five, seven plus years, um, we had a really great talk uh, that we heard yesterday that um, highlighted some of those key differences between uh, classic customer experience, consumer experience, and possibly uh, that hostage experience where if someone can't leave you, right, ignore retention. Uh, that's not quite as important because not only are they stuck with you for a long time, um, but when the time comes around to renew, you have to do a really bad job to have someone go through a really long implementation expensive process to switch to another platform uh, where you can much more quickly uh, measure some ROI when you focus on adoption of new technologies, new tools, um, and expanding the things that they use with you. So that's one example. What do we need? What resources do we need to create to help with strategy creation, evaluating technologies, and setting a foundation for ROI? Hi, um, Diane. I, I want. I would just urge you guys to look at a platform that I have. I've set through the demo. I plan to use it in the future. Uh, so it's called CX Suite. Sorry for the background noise. CX S U I T E. It's a got awesome module in it for ROI. Um, I'm sure it can be improved upon, but the demo that I looked at, um, it um, pulls together a employee experience, technology, as well as CX experience on three different tracks, and it codes them to the appropriate place. It prioritizes them using effort and um, feasibility. Um, cost, etc. So, I would, I would, it's a small company called CX Suite. So, I would urge you to consider that. Thank you, Christina. Anyone else? I don't really know where this falls, but I'd be curious to learn more about how to integrate other staff into your plan or ideas. Uh, to go off, I think it was Meredith that was speaking. I think the the biggest challenge that I see um, coming coming through multiple efforts, um, organizations don't truly adopt and or understand organizational change management. And then you move into user experience, and then you have customer experience. And at the end of the day, they they all do the same thing. They all deliver a, a very similar outcome, which is really focusing on the, the customer and having that customer then be a repeat and then showing the partner customer that you might be working with the value of everything that you bring to the table and being able to clearly communicate and articulate that in their own language and having that back and forth. And so from the very start of any of this, that, that overall buy-in and understanding 
from not only the the higher ups, but your partnerships, and then sharing that across your team so that you have everyone on the same page as to what this CX team or individual is going to do and how they support the overall effort. Thank you, Heather. And we only have two minutes left. So now it's kind of the free for all, right? Anything that we didn't catch in, in this large one-year journey base and anything else you wanna hear more about. And secondly, going through all of this, thinking about your own personal experiences, is there anything that you will do differently next time you take on a new role? Going off of, you know, what you'd like to hear more about, I would be curious if anybody here found like one really good book or one really good, even like YouTube series or anything that they found supremely helpful for them, um, just getting into CX overall. Right now I'm reading this book called The Effortless Experience um, by Matthew Dixon. And that talks about, you know, satisfaction doesn't equal loyalty. It's really about making the um, reducing customer effort and how to do that. So I found that really helpful. That's on the list of publications on the in the toolbox. But it's really small there. You can't uh, quite see it. But in the downloadable version, you can zoom in. Um, and I tried to be as agnostic as possible when creating this toolbox, right? So we have networking groups, publications, technology, and consulting partners. Promise I did not leave a single book or person or company out that was mentioned in the 28 interviews because I knew that'd be dangerous. I think it would also help to know, you know, there are so many things out there like the CXPA certification. Is it worth getting? If so, why? You know, like knowing more about what the right education is to get. Yeah, with that, I'm in the process of doing a certification through uh, Nelson Norman Group because it's more UX, but there is some overlap of where it talks about some customer journey mapping and stuff like that. So it'd be nice to know like some pros and cons between different platforms of certifications. Yeah, and change management as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Anybody else? Wish list items in our last couple of seconds or advice to others taking on a new role? Um, I have I have something to add just from the perspective of not like, again, not even being in the first year. <laughs> um, but I guess maybe having a, I guess it would be a template of what are the different roles that make up a CX team, right? So like if you had unlimited budget and you had all the research resources in the world, you know, what would a, like a, a more robust CX team, what, what would that look like? And then having a more like a smaller or a leaner team. You know what? What are the, the what are the roles that you need, and also what are the skills? And yesterday, um, at one of the presentations, I think when it was talking about kind of like not predicting the future, but just thinking about the future of CX, and there were different. I think there were different like prototypes, right? So there were. Um, I'm looking through my notes. Um, but the different, oh, so like the practitioner, the technologist, the futurist, the data architect, it would be interesting to see paths for CX professionals kind of, right? Because like you see, you see it, you know, there are people who are more like on the psychology side and there are people who are more focused on data. So it'd be interesting to kind of see tracks, I guess, for CX professionals and yeah, so that's just my perspective. I don't even, uh, just based, based on what I was um, hearing yesterday and today. Awesome. That's really, that's really good, Ishara. I think that um, the other piece of that is, um, and what 
kind of context, each of those tracks makes sense because, you know, defining the roles is so dependent upon what the organization needs, like their level of maturity and what they do, like all kinds of factors around it. So it's also the context around different tracks. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's really interesting to see like all of the different types of CX professionals and kind of the backgrounds that they have before they decided they want to go into CX. Um, but this is great. This is a great conversation. Thank you all for all your contributions. This has been really helpful. Yes, I believe we are at time. Again, huge, huge thank you to all of you for joining. You were vital to be part of this conversation. Otherwise, it would have just been me sitting here and going through slides, which is supremely boring. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark, for hosting us on this platform. And again, this work was sponsored by Quadient, uh, as well as the CXPA. Uh, so thank you all and uh, have a nice rest of your day. Thank you so much, Diane. This has uh, been very informative and I'm really glad to see all the interaction here as well. Thanks everyone for being a part of CX Forums and you can view these videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to hit me up uh, for the URL or I can probably just uh, find that here for you. Let me do that real quick and I'll just put it in the, in the link and uh, we'll be polishing off this uh, particular workshop shortly and it will be right here, which is in the chat section. So. You can go there and find all this stuff, and uh, hopefully it will all be there for you um, whenever you'd like to view it. So uh, thanks again, everyone. We'll see you around soon, and uh, keep in mind we are doing events in 2023 in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, Atlanta, Georgia, and Chicago. We'll be back in the fall in D.C., and we have a special thing going on in Vegas in February, uh, which is uh, actually going to be uh, co-hosted with MOFI. And we're involving Cirque du Soleil in that. It's a complete immersive experience. We're going behind scenes. We have the Cirque people coming to train us as experienced designers. It's fairly expensive, but it includes the hotel and all meals and the Cirque uh, and several other shows. Uh, if you'd like more information on that, feel free to hit me up. But anyhow, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.